Hello everybody, I'm Phyllis Walker, HR Analyst with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And today on Arizona Wildlife News, we show you how game and fish biologists count and measure Mexican wolf populations. Plus, we'll show you how the department is showing families how not only to hook, but cook their fish. And later, we'll follow along on a science-based field trip to teach kids and adults about wildlife, water, and the environment. We've got all of this and more today on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. The numbers are in and the department's work to recover the endangered Mexican wolves is coming along nicely. Join us as we show you their path to recovery. Starting out with weather, it looks sunny, high at 37. Winds are gonna be getting up there, southwest winds, nine to 18, gusts up to 30 plus. So we'll start out with 2701. That wolf might be paired with an uncollared. We're gonna catch that wolf if we can and bring it back to Alpine. Foremost, be safe. In January and February of 2023, the Mexican Wolf Interagency field team was hard at work. Go catch some wolves. <laughs> For a couple of weeks at the start of each year, the team uses helicopters to count and capture endangered Mexican wolves. This is really important because it gives us the chance to, to finish our end of year count to get a solid minimum count on this population so that we can track recovery progress. It's been 25 years since the reintroduction of Mexican wolves to their historic range in Arizona and New Mexico. The population started at zero, but a year ago, 196 wolves were documented in the wild. Haven't hit 200 yet. We'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll see what we count this year. The counting actually began on the ground in November. So that's us going out, trying to get visuals on the wolves using tracks in the snow, our trail cameras. Counting wolves by helicopter is one last step to ensure the most accurate numbers. And it also gives us a chance to put, deploy collars so that we have collars on these wolves so that we're able to, to track reproduction, all the different management activities that go into recovering wolves. But it also, the collars give us the ability to, to manage conflict. It makes us that much more effective in reducing and being proactive in preventing wolf conflict. It's showing in. So. so this is a male wolf that we're evaluating. He's been darted with drugs from the helicopter. These drugs immobilize him. So he is unaware of what we're doing and he does not feel any pain. We are supporting his body systems just as we would at a veterinary clinic with fluids. We're cleaning where we darted him, we're giving him oxygen and vaccines, drawing blood and radio collar. So he should wake up and not recall any of this and nothing here was painful, so should do nicely. When their sedatives wear off, the captured wolves are returned to the wild. A satellite radio collar on at least one member of every pack is the key to locating and managing wolves. And yes, there is a practical reason for decorating the collars with colorful tape. Uh, ideally, we're going to tape a collar that's going to look a little bit different than anything else that's in the pack. We're going to try to keep every color different for each wolf. It helps us identify them when they're on the trail cameras. I went with really bright and distinct patterns because a lot of times our photos are going to be at night. But genetic management right now is one of the most important aspects of, of recovery of Mexican wolves. And we're doing that through cross-fostering. 
We're taking wolves from captivity that are brand new baby pups, placing them into wild wolf dens, and then they're being raised wild. This wolf, number 2701, is a product of that process. He's a magnificent animal. He's just huge, he's healthy. And the other thing that's really awesome about that wolf is he is the offspring of a cross foster pup. His dad is alpha male 1471. He was born in captivity and cross fostered into an Arizona wolf den back in 2016. Since then, he sired five litters and at least five of his offspring have produced puppies of their own. And that's what we've been saying all along, that cross-fostering is a successful means of enhancing the genetic variability up here and maintaining the health of this population. At the end of 2022, the wild population of Mexican wolves in Arizona and New Mexico was well above 200. The year-end count documented a minimum of 241 wolves in the wild. That's a 23% increase over the previous year. There were also more packs and more breeding pairs than ever before. That's some significant momentum on the path to recovery for endangered Mexican wolves. Do you want to catch a big one or do you want to catch a lot of them? Not one. You want to catch a lot of them? Okay, that's good. It's a thrilling sport and a relaxing pastime. Go forward, we let the button go and the line goes out just like that. Today we are making a Jamaican style curried catfish. It's a way to eat local healthy food and have tons of good family fun. Ready, swoosh. Yeah, good. You just can't go wrong when you spend the day fishing. Hundreds of people found out for themselves April 6th at Cortez Park in Phoenix. We enjoy it. It's fun to be outdoors and it's for the kids. What's most rewarding for me is to see the kids get excited. Daddy, he got it again. They were there for the Arizona Game and Fish Department's Hook to Plate fishing event. It's family time together. It's, you know, unplugging, get away from the rat race, spending quality time together. There's huge value in that. It was co-sponsored by Phoenix City Councilwoman Thelda Williams, who made it possible for kids in attendance to get free fishing licenses, and by the Phoenix Police Department. We get to go around, help the, the future anglers that are here, a lot of them for the first time fishing and the interaction we have with the families and the kids is, is really invaluable and just goes towards that partnership of, of the police and uh, working with the community and building that, that relationship. So we're gonna fish with the cops, right? Yes, we're gonna fish with the cops. Mm -hmm. And so they wanna learn the fundamentals. They don't really go fishing much. <laughs> okay, our next one is two, one, two. Sportsman's nine. Warehouse held a raffle. Mm -hmm and many lucky kids went home with some pretty cool outdoor gear. Cool. All right, let's get another. So let's just do a single layer and then we'll season them. One of the main attractions was Chef Danielle Leone's cooking demonstration. Chef Allen, remember we still need one whole fish. So the catfish came from the lake. So if you're fishing today, you can bring one of these beautiful fish up yourself. And it's beautiful and it's red. So it's a fresh fish you can just run your knife across the bone so you get a nice clean fillet and you can see just little by little you just chip it away from its frame and there it is so we are teaching people how to take fish from hook to plate so we have catfish in this beautiful lake here in the park and uh, we are gutting them cleaning them filleting them and then we are cooking them down jamaican style just like we do at the breadfruit and teaching everybody how to do that Chef Leone's Breadfruit and Rum Bar Restaurant in Phoenix specializes in sustainable seafood. If you can have something that is of your community and close to home, it's gonna be fresh, it's gonna be delicious, you're gonna be inspired by the people around you, and you're supporting, you're supporting yourself, your well-being, your family's well-being, your neighbor, your community, and it has this gorgeous ripple effect when people come together and celebrate community. 
Isn't that so fragrant? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so That's exactly why the Uptown Farmer's Market was here. The event itself is a perfect blend of community and local food and home cooking. And that's exactly what a farmer's market is. So it's a great marriage for us to be here and we're just really excited to partner with this mission and bringing everyone together. And we've brought a few items here today that anyone can pick up some spices or herbs or vegetables to cook whatever they catch today. You caught two fish today? What'd you catch it on? On worms. Oh, see, nobody's trying worms. They're using hot dogs and bacon. So that's your secret bait. I'm fishing with shrimp, trying to catch some channel catfish. Uh oh, that's a tangle. You were looking for something to do, right, Dad? <laughs> yeah. It's great to see the kids come out off the couch and enjoy the sunlight. I always want to make sure that they have had fun fishing. Sooner or later, they're going to catch a fish if they have fun fishing. Some people caught fish, others did not but everyone got a really good taste of what fishing has to offer. It's very good. I don't know what else to tell you. It's just very good. Ah, I just caught a fish. <laughs> <laughs>
get a feel for how healthy the populations are and how well this area is supporting migrating hummingbirds. We, we do it at the end of July, which is a big time for our local broad-tailed hummingbirds here around the White Mountains that um, they should have a lot of babies out of the nest by now. But there are also a lot of rufous hummingbirds and calliope hummingbirds southbound. And so it's a time when we can, can pick up not only some of the local birds and determine how well they're doing, but also some of the migrants and again see how well this area is supporting uh, this diversity of hummingbird species that are here. Wow, it's a gorgeous adult male calliope. He's going to take a tiny, tiny little band. I'm going to test his foot just to make sure I know what size band to put on him. Oh my, yes, yeah, teeny little band. Okay, so he's going to get extra small band number M70599. Get the band lined up properly in my pliers. Alrighty there, bud. That looks good on you. There we go. Okay. Make sure it's properly aligned and rotated on the foot to make sure it doesn't doesn't bind anywhere. And I gotta tug it a little to make sure it doesn't come off, because even though it's the extra small size. He is an extra small bird. Okay, all right. So, bill length, 14.4, and that's in millimeters. Do everything in metric. Tiny little bill. He's peeing all over me, as they are wont to do. 38.7, short little wing. And a stubby, stubby little tail. 21. Measure the width of his R5. Three point seven. All right, check him for parasites. Oh. Mm, wow, been a long time since I've seen one of these little dudes. This is wonderful. Okay. Ooh, good for you, buddy. Checking for molt and fat. He is replacing a few of his body feathers, some of which may have just been knocked out in fights with other hummingbirds. Um, and he's got heavy fat, so he's probably been here at site for several days and is getting ready to move on. Uh, dash for breeding condition. Don't see any pollen on him today, um, and that probably reflects the very poor bloom conditions we've got. The uh, monsoon hasn't quite uh, caused the uh, normal late summer bloom that we like to see this time of year. So there's not a whole lot of hummingbird pollinated flowers out there for these guys. Oh goodness, are you three grams? You are three grams, wow. That's pretty good. Calliope males are usually around 2.5, 2.6 grams. They're little bitty guys. So he's got pretty good weight on him with all that fat. <clears throat> all right, buddy, let's get you a drink. All right, little buddy. Oh, he's a good looking bird. Wow. He is, he has got such extravagant purple, red. You want another drink? I don't care, bud. Okay, all right. You ready to go, buddy? He's not quite ready to go. Here he goes. <laughs> all right. Cool, cool, cool. All righty. So Tom's got me another bird already. So what we have here, we have a beautiful adult male broad-tailed hummingbird. He is just absolutely gorgeous. He's probably one of our local sight birds. Uh, so he's probably been around all summer. And now he's battling it out with all these rufous that have come in. He's gonna get a medium band, medium band number M71530. 
is going to be his band number. Get the band lined up in my little plier here. And there we go. And give it a little cross squeeze to make sure that it closes properly. Need to make sure it's lined up and rotates on the leg. All right, that's good, that's good. Okay, buddy, now we got to get his uh, measurements here. Okay. Bill length is 18.0. This wing is just magical. The outer two primary feathers of the wing are shaped especially to create that trilling sound. Sounds like a coach's whistle. 50.8. Wonderful long wing. Broadtails aren't very big hummingbirds, but they have big wings. It probably helps them fly in the high, thin mountain air. And they have wonderful long tails. They, they call them bro, broad-tailed hummingbirds, but they're really long-tailed hummingbirds. Oh, look at that. 33. Wow. Dude. That's quite a tail, son. Oh, man. What a bird. Mm. And they have this weird little bowling pin shaped feather has a little kind of a neck on it like a bowling pin and that feather when they do their display dives to impress the ladies or impress rival males that feather vibrates and creates a distinctive sound at the bottom of their dive okay all right so um dash for r5 grooves are none grooves are little find wrinkles in the bill where the bill's still young and growing and his obviously are not is not um so he doesn't have any grooves buff his little fringes on fresh plumage and he does not have any fresh plumage on him he's in quite worn plumage he's had a long breeding season here all right g count is the amount of adult male type feathers on his throat and he is um, fully accoutred with all the beautiful colors of an adult male so he's a 99 is our default there Okay, now, good, don't see any parasites up there. He is, does have a little bit of body molt, that's an indicator that it's the end of the season for him. Molt is slight body. And fat is only slight, though, so he's not really prepped for migration yet. Probably will be another couple of weeks at least before he's ready to go south. And dash for breeding condition, because he's a male. And I do not see any pollen on this guy. So dash. All right, so now we've got to get his weight. We'll give him a drink, and then I'll get a couple of pictures for documentation. All right, handsome. Get him rolled up like a little burrito. Okay. Yeah, not a lot of bird there. He is 3.5 grams. He's just a hair under. I'm rounding him up. 3.5. Not as much bird there as you might think. Okay. All right. Oops, let me, uh, Tom's got another bird for us. Let me do it quick. He wants a drink, but he doesn't want me to be giving him one. <laughs> well, he just doesn't want a drink. You ready to go, son? He is, he's ready to go, okay. Well, often at SIPE, we have hundreds of people in a, in a normal year there are hundreds of people here, and that speaks mostly just to the popularity of hummingbirds. People love their hummingbirds. I, I tell them if we were doing a workshop on flycatchers or sandpipers or something, there'd be a dozen people. But you talk about hummingbirds and hundreds of people show up. And some of the basic questions they, they want to know, first of all, why are we banding hummingbirds? And by putting that numbered metal band on the bird, it's like getting a social security number. It identifies that individual 
for the rest of its life. So if we catch that bird again, or if somebody else in another research project somewhere else in Idaho or Montana or who knows where catches that bird, uh, we can identify that as that particular individual that was here on that particular day. Well, Cypriot Mountain Wildlife Area it is one of our favorite visits this time of year. And it's also a favorite with birders and hummingbird photographers because the, the staff and volunteers here keep hummingbird feeders out. There are some flowers as well that the birds visit. And you know, in years when there are natural flowers, of course, that's even better. But the fact that they do maintain the feeders here, it brings in a lot of birds. Many of these birds that are here right now are probably birds that have been visiting these feeders every summer for their entire lives. And so you have this very well-established clientele of hummingbirds that in a year like this, when there's not a lot of natural nectar available to them, there's a lot of activity around the feeders and it's, it can be quite thrilling watching the birds buzz around. And so it's a lot of fun. That's gonna do it for our show today. Until next time, get out there and enjoy those Arizona wildlife views. To subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, visit www.azgfd.gov slash magazine. <laughs>